the, the supreme sacrifice I am making now in actually standing up with a cold and talking. Um, it's not easy. Um, right, okay. So, yeah, so some of you will have, uh, will have heard quite a bit of this um, the other day. So, um, so I'm desperately, in my head, trying to make it a little bit more relevant to the, the service chat. Um, but I sort of want to just tell you a story um, about, about me and about the things that influenced me. Um, and start off with a bit of a, a confession that, that uh, I know you won't believe this looking at me, but I, I actually grew up in the 1970s. Um, and, and when you grow up in the 1970s, um, it's quite a depressing experience because everybody keeps telling you how wonderful the 50s and 60s were. And nothing can ever live up to that. Um, I was born, I think, six months almost to the day after the Beatles split up. I, how dreadful is that? You know, so I missed out on that. Um, and when you grew up in the 70s, you had to put up with a lot of crap. Uh, the politicians were pretty crap. Um, the fashion was dreadful. Uh, <coughs> some of you might look into some with those boots and things. Um, the strikes were awful. I remember growing up with, with there were candles in all the cupboards. And it was only fairly recently I suddenly, it suddenly clicked what, what those were there for because there were blackouts and things like that. Um, petrol strikes and, um, and even the celebrities. Uh, we're, we're just crap, it turns out. We now know that Fetty Dog Jews love. So, <laughs> so it, it really wasn't a, a, a great time to grow up. Um, but it actually, some parts of it were fantastic. The TV was fantastic. And we knew at the time, I think we were living in the classic age of television, um, only three channels, believe it or not. And almost every night there was something only worth watching. I remember having arguments. I actually literally pushed my sister through a window <laughs> because we were, arguing, we were arguing about what to watch on TV. She wanted to watch Coronation Street and I wanted to watch something the intellectual watcher. Um, nowadays, um, there are probably 300 channels and, and never anything worth watching. Even the test card was worth watching. Um, and the only thing on now that seems to be worth watching is actually something that was made in the 70s. So, there was one TV program, of all the TV programs on, that shone above all the others. Uh, this was a great time. <coughs> this was a great time to grow up and be a Doctor Who fan. Um, this was the golden age of the series. It's just about to enter its, well, just ending its uh, second decade, which in those days was um, unparalleled. It was only soap operas that did that sort of thing. Um, and you had great writers. This was a period when people like Douglas Adams <coughs> wrote for the series. So if you're a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan, while he was writing Doctor Who, he was also writing Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and the influence and the cross influences are, 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 are obvious. The, the best companions ever, Sarah Jane Smith, my first crush. <laughs> Sarah Jane Smith. Um, and of course, this guy, Tom Baker, the doctor. Okay. Um, it was a great time to be a <coughs> doctor. It was a great time to be a doctor. Who fan. But it came a huge personal expense. Because, believe it or not, it wasn't cool to be a doctor. Who fan. Um, and I was mercilessly bullied for most of my childhood, uh, adulthood, and ever since, actually. <laughs> um, because I liked Doctor Who. And so while the Doctor was off sort of fighting these intergalactic bullies, I was having to fight the bullies back on Earth. <coughs> but I sort of learned how I think, from watching Doctor Who. Um, and that's really what I want to talk about, because I think I can sort of say everything I learned about life, I learned. Um, those, uh, those bullies and the critics of the series would often talk about, well, you know it's not real. You know it's just men in costumes, don't you? And the planets, they're not real planets. It's filmed in quarries. And I used to think, you know what, I know that. I'm a 
was stupid. Um, and, and actually, what I started to get from my interest in Doctor Who was I started to become really interested in how television worked and, and how writing worked. And I started having ambitions. I wanted to be somebody who worked on programs like this. I, had, I remember wanting to be a graphic designer, a set designer, a writer, a composer. Um, and it's interesting that a lot of the people that are around and very powerful in film, television, um, and other areas today grew up in the 70s and grew up with Doctor Who. You see, I had something that those bullies didn't have. I had an imagination. And that's key, is an imagination. Um, we underestimate the importance of our imagination. And there's a tendency now to think that it's all about effects, it's all about the quality of the graphics, it's all about the quality of the, of the imagery. And we forget the most important thing, which is the story. These two um, Doctor Who monsters are very similar in nature, they're sort of devilish. Um, the one on the right dates from 1972, I think, and the one on the left dates from a few years ago. Um, in terms of quality of effects, uh, the one on the left was, was pretty scary um, and pretty convincing. The one on the right, not so much. Okay. Even in 1972, it looked like a man in furry trousers. <laughs> <laughs> but what is important here is that the guy on the right comes from a story which is still talked about today, even by people who are Doctor Who fans who happen to watch it. It's very famous, this story, because I don't want to spoil the end, because I know you're all going to go off now and find the DVD of it. Um, but there's an explosion, a church blows up, right at the end. <coughs> and the BBC got lots of complaints about how could you blow up a church just for, for a TV program. Um, and actually, you look at it now, and it's not that realistic, that explosion at all. But what engrossed people was the story. The story convinced them. The story on the left, no one talked about these days, because the story wasn't that. And so we need to remember that you can't overcome a bad story with good design. The story is paramount. You used to be able to just show a picture of a, a shadow going up the staircase, and you'd have to wash out all the seats in the cinema the next day. It could be terrifying. It still is, I think, terrifying. If you're still one of these people that grows up scared of shadows, scared of the dark, then something like that is actually pretty terrifying. Um, you see, the slides are slightly out of order, so. <laughs> um, so it wasn't just, Doctor Who isn't just a TV program, there was lots of other stuff attached to it as well. You might find this hard to believe, but there were no DVDs back in the 1970s. And, uh, there were video recorders, but they were so expensive. That was science fiction, the idea that you know you might be able to take the TV program and come back to it. So once a Doctor Who story had been on, that was it. Very few repeats of Doctor Who in those days. Um, and in fact, the BBC wiped quite a lot of the old stories. And I think they are regretting it now. Um, so the only way you could you could catch up with them and relive them was through reading the novels. And so I learned to read with Doctor Who. I learned to enjoy reading, I also learned to enjoy writing. Um, because you had to create the pictures in your head, you had to sort of make up for the lack of visual imagery. And the special effects in books are far better than any special effect you'll ever get on television or in a movie. And about the same time, sort of the late 70s, the Doctor Who comic strip really came, um, it came into its own. This is a strip uh, illustrated by a guy called Dave Gibbons, who some of you will know the name, um, famous for The Watchmen. Um, and so again, you know, as a kid, reading this, you suddenly realised that the universe was a vast and terrifying place. But you also realised that you could contribute to the depiction of this vast and terrifying and fascinating place. I didn't, because I'm rubbish at drawing. <laughs> Sarah, um, yeah, uh, yeah, there were other costs as well, so um, I didn't learn anything whatsoever about women in Doctor Who because back then girls just were not into it. So I'm really annoyed now that it does seem that Doctor Who is very popular with the girls. Um, but what I 
Price for growing up in the 70s with growing up today? Mm, yeah, probably would. Um, and I did learn to respect women. I learned that girls, women, could be brave, could be independent, uh, they screamed a lot, they tripped up a lot, you know, but they could look after themselves. Um, this is a Douglas Adams quote, actually, from an episode of Doctor Who. Um, this is another thing that I learned from the program, is that if you want to better somebody, if you want to defeat a, a villain or your boss, um, you don't need better weapons, you don't need big guns. All you need is your ingenuity, your imagination. What Douglas Adams called a teaspoon and an open mind. And that is a vital thing as well, is having an open mind, seeing the possibilities in anything. The doctor is the ultimate student. He's not a teacher, he's a student. And he's never afraid to admit that he doesn't know something. He might bullshit about it, but he doesn't mind teaching himself something new or learning something new. He takes off the blinkers. He's not a specialist. He's a generalist. And this is one of the things that I've been trying over the past seven years or so to teach here at Dundee to students is if you come in to a college like this and you say to yourself, I'm a jewellery student, you are closing off so many possibilities about what that might actually mean if the only thing you look at is jewellery. What else could you be looking at? And that's where things like service design come in. But it's, it's interdisciplinary, it's cross-disciplinary. It doesn't, it doesn't require you to drop what's important to you. It requires you to build on what's important to you. <coughs> as well. um, so, you know, when I give advice to people about what they should be doing and, and things, I, 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 I don't... I remember when I was at Brighton and I took over a course and I had a huge reading list of books like this. And none of the students read the books on the reading list. Or they buy all the books and not read them. Um, and I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get, a work, get rid of the reading list. And I just gave people one book to read. And any of you who have been taught by me will know what that book is. The Tipping Point, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing whatsoever to do with design, okay? But it's interesting. And actually, you can connect everything in it to design. And what happened as a result of that was people kept coming to me saying, what can I read next, Jonathan? I want to read something else. Because they'd talk about it, they'd share it, they'd share the stories in it with other people. And that conversation would start things off. Um, and actually, by the end of it, most people had read more on the reading list they didn't get than if they had been given the reading list. So, take off the blinkers, start reading stuff that is nothing to do Start talking to people that are outside of your area of expertise. In one of the early stories, the doctor is asked by one of his companions, why does he always seem to be focused on trivial things? You know, we're being, we're being chased by Daleks, why is it that you're looking at the flowers on the ground or whatever? And the response comes, the least important things sometimes lead to the greatest discoveries. Serendipity, chance, accidental discoveries, those are the things that lead to be creative, to be innovative. So why not become a teacher? Um, I don't know. I keep asking myself that. Um, <laughs> usually, usually after I've been with quite a few of you in this room, I think, well, I don't think I'll become a teacher. Um, but, I, but I think because I see, I see learning as an adventure. Not teaching as an adventure. I've learned far more teaching here at Dundee than anyone ever learned from me. Which might seem like a bad deal if you'd been paid fees. You, know, you came along and the reason for being here was so that I could learn something. But, but teaching isn't about transmission of knowledge. Teaching is about sharing an experience and leading people on an adventure. Um, and the doctor does that. He's always lost. And the people who travel with him are lost as well. But they don't really mind. They might be terrified for most of the time, but at the end of the day, they don't really mind. And that's the sort of analogy I like to use when I think about teaching and learning, is that it's an adventure and it's okay to be lost. It's bad if you just go into a room and stand in front of students and just tell them stuff. 
you know, by the end of this lecture, you will know this, 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 and this. The best lectures I think I've ever given are the ones where I completely forgot what I was supposed to be talking about and went off on a complete tangent. And most of you didn't know I was being there. Oh. Um, but the doctor is also the ultimate designer because he finds people who have problems, he helps identify those problems, he helps them solve it, and once he's done his job, he's off. But he never forgets them. He never forgets what it is that he's achieved. Um, now this is the bit of the talk where on Tuesday it was all about, it's about to be about me, and, and I don't want to be, this to be about me, so I might skip over the next few bits, but what I sort of want to say is that, um, yeah, I'm leaving, okay? Um, but I'm not going to forget anything that happened to you. Um, and the reason why the program has lasted as long as it's lasted is because change is a part of it. When that first actor became a little bit too old to continue in the role, they thought, well, should we cancel the series or should we just completely change the actor? And he regenerated into something else. Um, and change is at its heart. And change is traumatic. When Tom Baker left the series, I was destroyed. Inconsolable. Um, but it didn't just be traumatic, it could also be exciting, invigorating, and energizing. So I'm off um, to Pastures New, to Cambridge. So I said at the start, everything I learned about life, I learned from Doctor Who. Okay, that's a slight exaggeration. But the important things that I think that I hold dear as values, and that I think you should all hold dear as values, as values are that you need to nurture your imagination. Don't ever criticise somebody because they're watching science fiction on TV. Don't ever criticise anybody because they're reading a comic. Don't ever criticise someone because they're standing in, and staring into space. Nurture their imagination. Allow them to have an imagination. Keep an open mind. Don't stop. Don't close yourself off to the opportunities that might reveal themselves to you by talking to someone in a completely different area. Always worries me that art design students are least to ever talk to art design students. One of the big assets that Dundee has is the fact that it's part of a university, that Peter Kelly is part of the university, and you have an opportunity to go out there and talk to people studying completely different subjects. Embrace irrelevance. Don't just focus on what you think is useful and important. Sometimes it's the kind of stuff that actually turns out to be useful and important. And share your experiences. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't, don't think that, that just because you've discovered something you need to keep it a secret. Um, because when you share your experiences, you pass on a little bit of knowledge, you build a connection, you collaborate, you allow someone else to grow as well. And you learn something in return. And the other thing I'd say to you is change. Don't be afraid to change, because you can't be creative if you're scared of change. It's part of who you are. It's part of what you do. Um, so I finished with this quote the other, the other night. Um, it's a quote from the program, when, um, when the doctor leaves behind his granddaughter on Earth and locks her out of the TARDIS and he says, one day I shall come back. Uh, until then, just go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I'm not mistaken in mind. I will come back. Um, I'm never really going to leave because, unfortunately, everyone seems to have my email address and Twitter handle. <laughs> and I, and I, I already got a text message this morning from a colleague asking me how to do something on their computer. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, if, 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 if I've influenced anybody while I've been here, it might have said that, that I had that sort of effect. Um, you know, hopefully that will continue, and you will pass those things on, and you might change them, you might discard some things. You have to become the teachers, you have to become the permanent students. So yeah, just go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I'm not mistaken in mind.